Electricity Minister Dr. Josien Tsuramojo by recently held a media briefing on the current state of electricity affairs in the country, including the increase in the stages of load shedding. This comes at the time uh, that uh, we received the latest uh, stats in terms of uh, the GDP product report for the second quarter of 2023, as well as the announcement of an increase in petrol and diesel prices earlier this week. Bahai Sudumelan, good evening. My name is Tabo Mulukwan. Welcome to this edition of Soweto Today. Tonight, we'll look at uh, the three key developments in the country. That is the electricity issue, the latest GDP report, as well as the recent increase in both petrol and diesel prices. Now, to kickstart our conversation, we are joined in studio via Zoom. Uh, that's uh, energy analyst uh, Tepo Khadima, who is an expert in the method to discuss the latest okay. electricity and load shedding developments. Ms. Khadima, thanks very much uh, for taking the time and joining us tonight on the show. Uh, good evening. Well, good evening to you, and it's good to talk to you. But talking to you from Limpopo, I would love to be in the studio with you. But I'm glad all the same we are able to speak, and I hope that uh, the viewers of Soweto TV will be able to benefit from our discussion. Much appreciated. I mean, we saw uh, the latest developments now with uh, the load shedding now heading to at least a stage six, owing to loss of generation capacity in some of the units. Now, to get a better understanding, when it comes to electricity generation, in the simplest terms possible, can you let us know what is the ideal electricity generating capacity and, uh, you know, where we are currently sitting? I know that uh, the minister previously said that we are around somewhere around 4,000 uh, in terms of the energy that they are looking for to add to the grid so that they can reach at least over 30,000 megawatts there. Where are we sitting currently? Look, the situation is not good at the moment. Uh, the electricity demand in the country is average of 29,000 megawatts. So ESCOM should produce at least 31,000 megawatts to have the 2,000 megawatt reserve margin in order for the grid to be stable, in order for there to be no load shedding at all. But what we have seen happen is that uh, ESCOM has consistently failed to perform optimally, whereby the energy availability factor continues to be below 60%, but there are a number of factors that lead to that energy availability factor being below 60%. One of, the, one of them being that the ESCOM boilers right now, they are not operating above, in terms of efficiency, they are not operating above 30%. The boilers are designed and calibrated to achieve a 33% energy uh, efficiency factor. And if they were able to achieve a 33% energy efficiency factor, then the energy availability factor would itself have increased. And the other problem that ESCOM has is that it currently has got well over 16,000 megawatts of power plant, which they uh, term to be in breakdown when actually they've mothballed it. They have not done anything to return to service that 16,000 megawatts of capacity, which they say is in breakdown. And for as long as they don't do anything to return that to service, we will unfortunately continue to be in load shedding. So I think anything that whether the electricity minister, Dr. Hossein Soramokhupa says, or the uh, public enterprise minister Pravin Godan says, or even ESCOM board says, don't believe it. The only time we are supposed to believe what they say is when they can show that they have placed an order of retrofitting their power plants with circulating fluidized bed boilers to be able to then increase the capacity above 30,000 megawatts. Mr. And Hadima, if they place an order mm. to retrofit, they can, there's, no, there's no reason why ESCOM cannot produce comfortably 37,000 megawatts from their proprietary fleet of uh, baseload coal-fired power stations.
Mr. Khadima, um, I, I want to touch on the issue of the warm weather conditions. I mean, uh, the ordinary person would think that there would be less uh, load shedding since we are out of winter now. But it seems like uh, nothing is happening. Is it an issue of, uh, you know, are we not building, as we said, that uh, we need to start building uh, more power plants that will be able to assist us to add more generation capacity to the grid? But it seems like uh, now we are uh, close to six hours of uh, you know, blackouts, this is really something else. Look, I think people like myself are on record for a very long time for having said ESCOM has got well over 48,000 megawatts of capacity that is proprietary to itself. Coupled with that, there's another 6,000 megawatts of so-called renewable independent power producers. The problem is with their so-called renewable independent power producers is that 100 percent of the electricity they purport to produce is useless is redundant it never reaches any customer in the country escom knows this the renewable guys know this the government know this they know this is the biggest looting scheme it's a thieving scheme but they somehow they appear to be constrained from taking appropriate action of terminating all those onerous power purchase agreements with the so-called renewable independent power producers. Because if there are 6,000 megawatts was indeed usable on the grid, we should not be sitting in a situation where the country is now having to burn so much diesel, diesel which in any case ESCOM buys at, I, I had something staggering that in the month of August, ESCOM was paying 28 rand a litre for diesel to generate electricity. No country, no economy anywhere on this planet does that except ourselves. And it is no wonder that ESCOM finds itself in the financial troubles that it is. And for as long as they refuse to retrofit circulating fluidized bed boilers, which are the clean coal technology, I have been stating this to ESCOM, to the government, since 2015, pleading with them. And for as long as they refuse to take that appropriate action, load shedding will not end, except it comes at revenue losses to ESCOM in excess of 200 million rent a day. It also comes at an unnecessary cost for businesses, even for households who are having to find alternative sources of energy, which largely are generators, and those that have now installed solar PV on their rooftops, they have had to go and take second mortgages, second bonds when interest rates are high. So people are being impoverished left, right, and center, not only because of the high fuel cost, not only because of the high electricity costs or electricity tariffs but also because they now had to go and borrow money just to be able to have access to energy and this is totally unacceptable but also ESCOM now is at least overstaffed by 20,000 people so ESCOM has to actually fire 20,000 people because the electricity they are currently generating can be generated by no more than half of the staff complement they have and ESCOM has got 43,000 employees but they actually need half of that staff complement to be able to generate the electricity they are currently generating and to believe that they can fix their old power stations they are tantamount to somebody who's flying an aircraft without avionics in the cockpit they are flying in the dark it is therefore not surprising that when the power plants break down, the ESCOM management are themselves caught by surprise that the power plant has broken down when they should have been able to anticipate it before it happens and take corrective measures. So you also have for the situation a problem of ineptitude and the management philosophy that is just simply is, is incompetence to say the least. Mr. Because Hadima, by now, very they much, have uh, had a handle, mm. and I've stated before, within three months, you can end load shedding. Here we are, 
from the time I've been stating that we are 18 months and we are nowhere near ending load shedding, it will continue for the next 10 years at the current trajectory. Mr. Khadima, thanks very much. Unfortunately, in the interests of time, I have to let you go. Much appreciated. Always a pleasure having your insights on the show. That was uh, energy expert uh, Tsepa Khadima speaking to us about the latest developments as far as the ongoing electricity challenges and the increase in load shedding stages. Currently now we know that uh, the country has been rotating between stage 5 and stage 6 load shedding which uh, simply translates to just over 6 hours of power cuts. We hope that uh, uh, that will be resolved in the next uh, you know, few months as the electricity minister has promised that at least by the end of the year they would have uh, over 9,000 megawatts to add to the uh, generation capacity at least to reach 29,000 so that we can have a stable grid but uh, it remains to be seen if that will happen. Let's take a quick ad break. Uh, when we come back uh, we speak about the latest uh, GDP report and what it means for us to stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Soweto Today. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. My name is Tambo Malukwani. Let me now bring in uh, my guest, uh, Stephen Mantu, who's joining us via Zoom, just to talk about uh, the latest uh, gross domestic product, uh, you know, the stats that was released by Statistics, Statistics South Africa, you know, on, on Tuesday, which shows that the South African GDP uh, expanded by 0.6% in the second quarter of uh, 2023. Stephen, thanks very much for taking the time. Good evening. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much and uh, hi to your uh, listeners uh, and viewers from home. Much appreciated. You know, uh, I mean, uh, Stats SA reported uh, that uh, the economy grew by 0.6% uh, in the second quarter of the year. Following the first quarter's growth of um, just a 0.4%. Um, uh, maybe before we talk about what does this actually mean, I saw that uh, actually the numbers were boosted by also agriculture, which did well after shrinking by 12% in the last quarter. Just uh, maybe take us through that. Yeah, uh, uh, generally the second quarter and the third quarter of the economy uh, are generally the biggest contribution in terms of agriculture. So what happens is that uh, the harvesting of uh, your uh, cereals or other type of piece of agriculture do start to yield during that time. And uh, that being a case, it means that uh, the, the second and the third quarter, we are likely to see the growth in terms of agricultural uh, uh, production. And again, if you, you look into what is happening into things such as uh, mining, such as manufacturing, it shows you that if we have uh, agriculture and mining grow, then we will have manufacturing grow. So that is what contributes a lot to what we see, the growth of the GDP growth during the second quarter and going into the third quarter. Mm. I mean, what if any positive consequences will we experience as a result of this upward trend in the GDP? I know that it's 0.6% and then uh, the, the initial predictions were just about uh, 1.7 uh, trillion. Uh, you know, rents, but uh, we are sitting at around 1.6 trillion. Um, um, you know, in terms of that, um, should we take the numbers as they are now, or there's still some positive that's going to come in the next quarters? Yeah, next quarters, as long as there's one issue which is remaining, if we check, you'll have seen that the domestic economy. Uh, it's performing very, very well, but uh, as compared to the international economy, which is coming back with uh, the USA economy, coming back with the China economy becoming better, uh, that uh, of course contribute a lot to what we have here in the country. But then if we had to look into the domestic, as long as we still have load shading, which is up, uh, at uh, of course currently stage six and sometime going between stage three and stage six it means that we still are gonna have a problem of not growing as expected but then the growth we're gonna see it because the economy itself has shown us to be robust in terms of 
uh, improvement and development. So that is where I'm saying that if we, we, we are to compare into the international economy, we're doing better, but if we are fixing the issue of load shading, then that's where you'll see us having a better uh, economic growth as compared to the current one. I mean, you did touch on uh, particularly, you know, the what contributes to the increase and decrease of the GDP there, as we were speaking about those various industries there. But, uh, you know, I look at uh, the stronger, um, uh, uh, how the, the RAND also has been performing. As you mentioned that uh, there is the issue of um, load shedding, and we're also still suffering from uh, the uh, 40, 475 uh, basis points uh, in, 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 in rate hikes over 18 months and just generally persistently high inflation. What does this mean for the general public, for me and the person who's outside, for me and you, if I may put it that way? Yeah, if we had to look into the general economic perspective as you, you are trying to highlight it, it's that we, we are having the economy which is showing robustness regardless of uh, the interest rate not doing well but as far as the months things in terms of uh, your inflation where the inflation has gone below six percent but again if you were to look into the issue of job creation we have seen a little bit of job being created so it means that the economy, regardless of the shock which we are coming across, it's robust. And if it's robust, it means that then the economy of South Africa doesn't only depend on uh, what is happening, which is low shading. But if the issue of low shading become resolved, we will see more production in the coming time because a lot of companies now are not performing as they must perform because of load shedding. But what does it mean to me and you uh, who's uh, at home? It means that if we still have load shedding, we're still going to pay high prices of food because companies are losing uh, their revenue in terms of that. So they're going to try to take as much as possible food uh, and commodity prices up so that they are or we are able to pay for that debt which they are having. Mm. Um, just before we go for an ad break, I mean, how do we keep this upward trend going and avoid a decrease in the GDP? I mean, in the second quarter, the South African economy just grew, uh, you know, by just was just around 1.6 percent bigger than the year before. But when you look at GDP, it has not recovered in its uh, previous peak there, you know, uh, reaching in the third quarter. How do we then make sure that we keep that upward trend so that at least, uh, you know, uh, the, the cost burdens can be eased for the general public? Yeah, what, what the government has done uh, to, to give them a boost to us to look into what we call economic reforms. So their economic reforms are working. So if we are to focus on those economic reform and boost the, or work along with the government as the industries, as the population, we will see more growth. But I'm, I'm still, I'm gonna try to talk as much as possible to say load shading is delaying the country. Let us take a quick ad break. Uh, when we come back, we will look into the increase in the price of fuel more on uh, so to today coming right after this welcome back you're still watching so to today thank you for choosing to stay with us we are still in conversation with economist uh, Stephen Mantu. before the ad break we unpack the statistics South Africa's gross uh, gross domestic product uh, report for the second quarter of uh, 2023 and now we shift gears and speak on the increase in petrol and diesel prices this week the petrol price went up by one rand 71 cents per litre while diesel increased by between two rand 76 cents and two rand and 84 cents a litre Stephen is still joining us uh, now uh, via zoom Stephen thanks very much for staying on I mean uh, people are complaining that now it is becoming ridiculous when you look at uh, the numbers, uh, you know, going up in terms of the petrol price. I mean, just over one rent, 70 rents in price hikes and just two rent, uh, 80 something when it comes to the diesel. I mean, this is just getting out of order. Why are we seeing an increase in petrol and diesel prices at the moment? So uh, what I'm going to do is to 
a little bit unpack how the formula is calculated. Uh, and then I'll go in deeper into explaining the three factors which is uh, which are affecting the current growth. So what is happening is that in, in, in terms of the formula, we there's a, what we call the retail contribution, their taxes, there's what we call uh, the refiner's contribution, uh, and then what uh, then goes to a slate tax, which is currently 0%. So what happens is that with the three factors which is which are uh, contributing a lot now is that globally we have seen an increase in the crude oil prices that means that non-refined oil prices are up and they've been up for the entire month of august and they've been very high but the second factor which is uh, what we must look into as the country is the issue of the rent versus the dollar. So what happens is that South Africa buy dollar and then use that dollar to buy fuel. So if the dollar prices it's up, that means that we're going to buy fuel with more money. And fuel, according to OPEC, it's sold by a foreign currency. And in, in, in terms of South Africa, we are still using a, the dollar as a, a foreign currency. So the third factor is that uh, the, the, in each and every September we have increased in terms of the, pri the, the the wages and salaries of those people who are working in filling station and refinery. And that is signed by the minister as a, a standing increase, which is now five cents per liter, which is, that means from now going forward, that five cents per liter is not going to change. We're going to have it as a fixed uh, rate. but. Then let, let, let's go to this three factor. That means South Africa will have to take a decision of saying, if they are going to buy in a foreign country, they must buy directly with the foreign currency, which is used by that country. For example, if we are to buy in Russia, we must be able to use the Russian uh, 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 currency. If we are to buy in the Arab uh, world, we must be able to buy with their current uh, 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 currency. But if we are to still use the United States dollar, then we're still going to have a problem because we have to buy the dollar before we can buy the product. Mm. Um, before we continue with the discussion, I want us to listen to some of the motorists that have reacted to the fuel price hike, you know, saying that they are definitely feeling the pinch. So let's take a look at uh, what they had to say. The price has gone up, which means that you need to top up the fuel. And uh, where are you going to get that money? Everything is pricing now. Food, uh, petrol is another thing. Now it's going to influence food rice, even levies and everything. So now it's a disaster. Yes, affects are there because we're running um, IFAS food. Né? So we have to deliver for our band to bay too. And then as well as we cook, we have price to cook. But at the end of the day, we have to petrol. So yeah. You know, the petrol is a effective business. There's nothing gonna change. Uh, almost that I see that everything that is going again up is going again up more than the way it was before because we were just managing about the things that was before. Now they're still increasing the petrol. Now we don't know what to do. Stephen, I mean, taking into consideration the already high cost of living and high unemployment rates, can South Africans really uh, afford all these increases? I mean, not just petrol, but the impact on also the food prices and other prices. As you heard some of the motorists there saying that, look, now it's becoming more difficult. Now, there's no way that a, a normal South African will live out of this amount of money uh, which they are earning. So hence a lot of them now are using credit as a solution. But generally, we, we have a, a bigger challenge in, in a country. The inflation is high and this inflation contributes, of course, because of food prices and fuel. And now the transportation cost is high and with the increase, then we're going to have bigger challenges of uh, the growth again in terms of these challenges. I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, for, for a person who is at home, for a person who is staying at a specific place in uh, uh, the villages or the township, 
who are not employed, it's it's difficult. But those people in the cities who are getting salaries and wages, it's more difficult because the lifestyle in the cities and the uh, your towns are expensive as compared to those who are in the villages and the township. I mean, if uh, one person is staying in in Houting in Johannesburg. The transportation cost is affecting them. The electricity cost has went up. Food prices has went up. And that person is affected. I mean, I, that means salaries are, must be increased, and which is impossible because of other factors which uh, are affecting even producers and even service providers. So it is it is difficult for us as the country. It's difficult for the people to survive with this less amount of money. Uh, in, in, in brief, before I let you go, I mean, could we possibly see a decrease anytime soon or are we projected to continue seeing an increase? I mean, we saw statements coming from the National Taxi Alliance, the Santacos. Now they are contemplating the issues of increasing the taxi fares. Obviously, this will somewhere, somehow, you know, affect uh, the general commuters. Yeah, but uh, it, it, even though it's uh, that how where Santaco and the Taxi Alliance are considering that, but I, I, economically, I think they are becoming unfair to commuters because we are coming from increased fuel prices and they increased uh, their fares. Then the fuel prices dropped significantly for a number of months, and there was never a say about the fuel prices increasing. So for, for them, they are becoming unfair to commuters. But indeed, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge. But what, what I'll, I'll touch on is that this is a temporary soon, um, a measure. Because if we can see the rent against the US dollar dropping, or if we can see the, uh, the fuel price or the crude oil prices dropping in the coming month then that means we are going to go back to normal i mean it's a it's a win-win the other months we, we we get high the other months will get less steven mancho thanks very much uh, for taking the time i know a lot of people are saying that even if you know the petrol prices may go down the taxis will still go up but we will see what happens in that regard much appreciated for joining me this evening that was uh, steven uh, man, so the economist said, uh, just talking to us about uh, both the latest statistics, uh, you know, GDP uh, results uh, for 2023 for the second quarter, as well as the recent increase in both petrol and diesel. Uh, thank you also to energy expert uh, Tsepo Khadima who joined us earlier as we spoke on electricity and the latest load shedding developments. Well, that's how we wrap it up for today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you. So please feel free to talk to us about this episode. Simply send us an email at Soweto Today at Soweto TV or you can simply just call WhatsApp us at 081-531-8857. Bahai so yare nate mare khatile. For myself and the rest of the team, Good night and thank you for watching.